All right. What is going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of your favorite true crime and criminal culture podcast, Thought Right Podcast. My name's Brendan. Welcome to the show. And I'm Malia. What? Say it. It's it's better going second because then you get to like up what I just did. So actually I'm being nice. No. What I would still say it. We have a lot of people here that are here for the Malia experience. And they don't get it if I don't say welcome to the show? No, I just don't think it can be said too much. I'll start doing JLR's whole gig. Come on in. Come on in. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. But uh, yeah. Welcome, everybody. Um, I don't know if uh, while we work out all these little kinks and figure everything out, I know we have our Thought Riot podcast axiom scrolling at the bottom. I'm not really sure if I'm going to continue saying it. I guess I will for now, though. Um, but here at Thought Riot Podcast, we commit to being honest, intelligent, unscripted, interesting conversations, bringing information we get, following it to wherever it leads, holding nothing back, sharing brutal honesty the entire time because we censor nothing. And talk about everything. Woo. Okay, now say welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. All right. All right. All right. So... I'm excited to get into these stories tonight. You know, one of the things we were planning on doing yesterday is we were planning on bringing completely different stories to the table, but there there have been a couple different developments already in just a 24-hour period that I feel like need to be talked about. So we are definitely going to talk about Sebastian Rogers. Um, and then what were you bringing? I know you said it to me, but I don't remember the name. She's on our thumbnail. Chelsea uh, Grimm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yep. Chelsea Grimm. And uh, so that should be a good topic as well. We'll get into some Idaho four. I just have some major questions and uh, there's been some content that has come out recently from a couple different uh, content creators in the community that got my brain going, you know, got my brain working and thinking and, and trying to figure things out. And I, I personally like thinking out loud and in this setting, I feel like between the chat of, you know, our chatters, our viewers are like some of the most intelligent people, I think, that are out there when it comes to the true crime community or in general, because there are so many comments out there that just like blow me away, literally speechless. It takes me like 30, 40 seconds just to compose myself with that idea or theory that that somebody shared. So um, I always like bringing raw topics to the table on here and then talking through them and figuring it out with everyone, you know? So, um, that's the plan for myself, AKA just another word of, uh, not doing research on the topic that I wanted to cover, but, uh, we're going to get through it and it'll be a good time. So, okay. so what, what is it that you didn't do research on that you want to cover? Um, well, so I have two Idaho four topics that I've been researching for the past couple of days. One of them is a very tin hat topic, extremely tin hat topic that I do want to talk about, but I'm probably going to wait until tomorrow to talk about it. The other one is directly uh, involving um, the docket and some of the records that have come out. Um, and uh yeah, we'll just get into it then. I There's a couple things I have to do here if you want to start your story. Yeah? Which one are we starting with? Uh, I wasn't planning on going first either. <laughs> I mean, I didn't have everything pulled up on my computer yet, so... I was just running super late for getting the podcast uh, stuff up, so... 
And there's a whole bunch of comments I still need to get back to that I'm not going to do here, obviously. But uh, I wasn't able to put any of the information in that was attached to our normal content. So, um, I mean, just start. Why don't you start with Sebastian Rogers? It is literally has the most eyes on it right now, the most attention. Um, and I think has uh, the biggest impact. We still have a child out there missing um and uh and it needs to be talked about plus that's one of the topics where normally when we bring like three or four topics to the table we try and time ourselves so we don't let it get out of control but when a child's life is on the line here i who needs a timer you know what i mean so i want to be able to give that conversation and topic as much time as we need to to work through it um and I do think that's one of the things we're talking about. I didn't get to watch the interview myself, but I do know about it. So um, do you want to give like the, the rundown of it? Yeah. So um, Sebastian Rogers, if you guys haven't been following our coverage on the case or the case at all, he is a young 15 year old um, autistic boy who also has a chromosome deletion um, and ADHD, who went missing February 25th of this year. He's been missing ever since, and he seemingly levitated out of his room and has never been seen again, like abducted by aliens. Okay. Yeah. That's how we, this seems. There's because no there's evidence. no evidence of him ever leaving his home, zero at all, other than he's just gone. He's just gone. And, uh, you know, his shoes weren't even taken. L literally, the clothes on his back and a keychain flashlight are the only things missing. Um, his father's been, you know, put to the street, hunting for him, searching for him, putting up flyers. There's been a ton of drama in this case. A lot of finger pointing at the mother who was there at the time of him disappearing. Um, and the stepfather, who a lot of people just don't like his personality, the way he handles it, um, the inconsistencies and the things they've said in interviews. Cause let me tell you, there's a lot of them. Um, you know, Chris recently, Chris Proudfoot, the stepfather recently backed out of a polygraph that Nancy Grace offered to set up for him. Uh, it sounds like the birth father, Seth Rogers is going through with his, uh, he has not been told by law enforcement not to, um, but yeah, that's basically where we're at in the case. And the latest is on a podcast called Justin on TikTok. You know, Seth recently said that, and this is trigger warning, because this is going to be a big part of what we're going to talk about tonight regarding this case and what was going on with Sebastian. He told everyone that Sebastian had been abused and when he was around seven or eight in California when they still lived out there by a kid that was five years older than him. Last night on the show, on the True Crime Talk Show, we read the mother's response um, to all of that. And since then, you know, literally at the same time we were live, Seth was on the Pascal show uh, clearing some things up. I got through most of that interview. I... And a lot of things were kind of cleared up, but not really. Um, I wish he was a little more detailed on some of his responses. Um, like when Pascal show said, you know, you said that she didn't get him any help, but she claims she did. She got him all the available help. Is that true? And he's like, he literally just side skirted that question, which I didn't really appreciate if I'm being honest. Um, yeah, say, well, say, but he never said that she never got him help. He just said, not the right type of help. Correct. In that original conversation, he did say that she took him to a doctor, but it was not a therapist or a psychologist. And when he tried to follow up with that doctor, that doctor was like, look, I'm not the right type of doctor for that. Um, yeah, because so. right when they got divorced... He she went out of her way to start getting him medicated in every which way possible. Yeah. Um, yeah. so he was on I don't want to make that seem like it's a, a 
something wrong though i know it's a touchy subject well, he's medication got a lot of things going on too yeah, so i can yeah. understand wanting to try medication let's yeah. be honest i can understand it and and, and i'm not watching... putting anybody down who puts their kids on meds um, right. as long as you're working with a doctor doing it responsibly if they work for your child then by all means yeah and anyone watching too right now just so you guys know um you know anytime we're talking about a situation that i feel like is getting very dramatic i go in like hyper objectivity mode where i'm even like more attentive to the the subjective and dramatic and gossipy nature of any case so um, when I'm hearing these stories, like I automate, it's almost an automatic response. Like, whoa, wait, wait, hang on, hang on. I don't know if I should take that into consideration. Whoa, hang on, hang on. You know what I mean? And I'm constantly doing that in my own head. Um, so like when I hear things like that, a lot of times I'm, I'm sitting here out loud trying to consider like, okay, but yes, like you said, he, he, it sounds like he had quite a few issues. So uh, it makes sense that there would need to be some medication, even though the birth father had talked about it clearly with the tone of his voice and the way that he was presenting it, that he didn't agree with that medication choice. You know what I mean? Yeah, he didn't agree with yeah. it. Um, and he that's why I said that those were his words that mm -hmm. she did everything to get him medicated um, after they got their divorce. They talked about um, more situations like there were allegations that he had become violent towards uh, Sebastian and he was removed from the base for it. Um, from what he said, he never hit Sebastian. What happened was um, Sebastian wasn't cleaning up his room like he was supposed to. He said, if you clean up your room, I'll take you swimming. He still didn't do it and made even a bigger mess and was like naked and being crazy, you know, and um, which sounds like kind of a funny situation. Um, yeah. And he's like, all right, fine, then you're not going to like get ready and go swimming. I'm going to go swimming. So he goes and puts on his swimming trunks and gets his stuff and goes to leave. And he's going to leave. And Sebastian's like something happens. I don't remember the entire thing, but something happens where i think sebastian's like trying to run out there or something and he trips and seth puts his hand on the door frame right before uh, sebastian's head is about to hit it to block him is what he claims dude um and he says that sebastian ran outside and told his mom that his dad hit him in the head dude Oof. that is not funny the situation's not funny what i'm thinking about is like how society presents uh, abusive situations between a man and a woman, right? We've seen in movies, we've seen in Hollywood and all these things where there's always some excuse like that, where it it's always, so, there's always some reason, right? Um, so look, if it's a one-off situation, sure, maybe, I don't know. But if it's this one-off situation, I mean, don't you think it wouldn't have been a, as big of a deal as it currently is, though? It's never no other situations been brought up, though. That's literally the isolated situation that I've heard of. No, I mean, backhanding her with braces. There's huh? That we're not talking about Chris Proudfoot. We're talking about Seth. Oh, oh. He was accused of being violent to Sebastian and being kicked off the base, so, okay, even though yeah. he You're was an armed about San Diego when security they were, guard. OK, OK, I'm sorry. He I was, misunderstood you probably while I was getting this stuff set up. But uh, yeah, I, I, I did hear about that. And that's when they came to check his arsenal is what he said. Um, and we have no confirmation of that. But he was cleared all the way around. He only had two, two guns, he said. A personal yeah. one and a work one that was issued to him because he was security on base. The way um, I and look he at is, that is who cares you know, if you have an he's arsenal currently, as long as it's legal. He's currently a, like a corrections officer. I think might even be considered a sheriff's deputy. Not he's a corrections officer. That's very different than a sheriff. Yeah, deputy. but I think I'm I'm not 100% sure if he's working at a prison or the county jail. Because if he's so, working at the county jail, he's a sheriff's deputy. So, yes, if he's working at the county jail. But he said multiple times that he's a corrections officer. Um, so 
corrections officers I know are normally different. the the prison's uh um guards on site there. Sheriffs have to be I know over the, the jail. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of times they work very closely together and the Department of Corrections a lot of times uh, gets their background checks and everything done through the Sheriff's Department who works directly with the FBI for these federal background checks. Um, but uh, but they're very different, very different, I, I would say. They're very different. Not one is better than the other. I'm using his own words that when he was talking about the investigators, he was like, look, you guys, I am I'm a corrections officer. I am an amateur when it comes to anything law enforcement or in uh, as an investigator. So I would assume that he is just a corrections officer. Well, he said last night on the Pascal show he was a sheriff's deputy that worked at the jail. So I don't. I, I j literally just watched that part and heard that part. Uh, so I don't know. I have no idea. Um, I just don't know. I, I mean, I thought he said corrections officer in the past, too. And then I heard that on the Pascal show. So I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, all I know is he works in guarding inmates, I guess. But uh, mm -hmm. anyway, where where was I going with that? So he tried to clear that up, um, though. I mean, yeah, it's kind of a weird situation. He hasn't been involved in any, any other abuse situations that I know of. Um, but it sounds like it was a really nasty, nasty divorce. And it sounds like Katie was trying to make him out to be a very dangerous, uh, violent person, um, which he doesn't seem to be uh, from the rest of his record like the rest of his at least what we know of his yeah. past like what other people say about him yeah there's pl there's way more people saying bad things about katie and chris than there are seth but then again right. it's slanted that way yeah so it's it's really hard to be objective about that so, when it's all being slanted that way yeah so one thing i want to take out of it uh is anybody's opinion on any of these parents right so what i was looking at when i was listening to their divorce is that she and and there are doc there is documentation out there but um she submitted a report uh having him removed from their home for abuse and uh, he thought it was abuse on her. It was actually abuse um, towards Sebastian, which then opened up a, an investigation into him. He was never charged. There were no notes uh, by CPS claiming that there was any confirmation of abu abuse or anything of the nature. Now, why I tend to believe that there wasn't abuse there from him um, is because he worked in security positions that require very extensive background checks through federal em em employment type background checks like FBI background checks. So when they dig into those background checks, depending on like if you're going into law enforcement or a corrections officer or anything of that nature, uh, or if you're a weapon carrying uh, security guard, which he was, he was working on a military base. He was a an armed guard um, and he works at Department of Corrections. Uh, and all of those require very thorough and extensive background checks. So I'm more likely to believe that there wasn't any violence coming from him in his background um, than I am to believe the flip side because I feel like the objective evidence there can support that and we don't have to turn towards people's opinions if that makes sense. Sure, yeah. Um but anyway, I mean, the most important part of Seth's interview on Justin um, on TikTok was about the abuse and him blaming it all on Katie and Chris and saying, you know, she doesn't check on her kid. She's not a good mom. Sebastian did not want to live with him or go back to their house. Um, and yeah, that that they allowed that to happen. It happened on their watch and that Chris was, um, he didn't want 
Sebastian around his daughter because he didn't want the same thing happening to Faith that happened to Sebastian. Yeah, which, which is really that's one thing that I wanted to bring up too that I know we talked very briefly about um, earlier, which I don't know if you were planning on going we, into it. I, I don't want to take it, huh? I am. Okay. Yeah. And I'll wait till you bring it up. No, we're bringing it up right now. Oh, so, okay. what do you think about it? Um, so, we had talked very briefly about this idea of how many news sources are coming out here uh, and and saying like, oh, how dare them for even bringing this up or talking about it at all. And what's interesting is that that pushes that secret narrative when there is abuse from a child or abuse to a child. And I personally don't agree with that because there's already. And for those of you that are on here and are new or watching us for the first time, if you didn't watch yesterday's or the day before's video, I am uh, an abuse survivor myself from when I was like five or six years old. Okay. So I dealt with it. I understood the, I understand the feelings that you go through having to overcome that and, all, and everything. So this, and, and the thing that took the pat all the power out of that abuse when I was younger was the fact that I'm not afraid to talk about it. It is not a secret. I don't care who knows. And I hope more people know because I would love for somebody to, that's going through something like that or dealing with stuff like that to be able to find someone and ask for their opinion or what they did. You know what I mean? Be, be a resource out there. But when you're watching these news media sources right now, they're coming out here and, and making it seem like, well, they shouldn't be airing that. They shouldn't be airing this. I mean, maybe, but maybe not. I mean, I, I don't know. Why does it need to be a secret when something was done to a child that they had no say in? They weren't even old enough to to know what that was and they were abused against their will i i don't know i don't know i don't know um it just doesn't feel very healthy or fair or right so i just want to say we're not pointing f fingers at chris and katie we're, we're not saying we think they are involved or to blame um we're not saying that about seth we're not pointing fingers at anybody we're asking questions we're looking at the case right now and what's being talked about and that's it. Um, you know, I think we're we're pointing fingers at the red flags that we see in any situation in here. So there is no bias. We aren't I'm not sided one way. I think I said to you earlier about the the dad how all of a sudden, which you brought up really good example, but after today's News Nation interview, I watched that News Nation interview. It was uh, Court TV. Or Court TV. Court TV, I'm sorry. And and I was like, that's really strange. His tone sounds like more upbeat. He's talking about like they're going to hold a vigil, which almost feels like it's being willing to close a book. No, and they've done like six of those or five or okay, five of them or something like and that. And being willing it's to just be a like, I'm not. My doctor told me I can't search anymore. Just his presentation, his character, and his tone threw me off a little bit. So again, I'm going to call all the red flags where I see them. I am not biased towards anybody. I, I only care about finding the victim in this situation or missing child in this situation. And, uh, you know, that that's Sebastian. So um, wherever the red flags pop up, we're going to call them. Yeah. Um, but what I pointed out with that is, for one, he's probably gotten sleep, which he hasn't had right. since Sebastian went missing. Or he's on um, pain meds. He's on muscle relaxers, which definitely make you feel good. OK, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say and that. that's a good call. Out. Um, and maybe some painkillers. Uh, but I know for sure muscle relaxers, which definitely make you feel good and honestly make me pass out. Um but he's and like I said, he's getting sleep. So I think that those things and he was on like more of an official news source, not like a podcast, because um, on the Pascal show last night, he was much different. He was more like the way he was than he, the way he was on court TV. But anyway, um, moving forward, uh, I. 
I don't feel like it's fair for everybody to get on to Seth for sharing that. Um, and part of the reason is, is I feel like as a society, if we look at it like a shameful thing, like, oh, no, sh nobody should know that. Nobody should know that about you. Nobody should know that happened to you. Even if you don't say it's shameful, even if you don't say you should be ashamed of that. Yeah, that's an awful thing that happened to you. You should not be talking about that out loud because it's shameful. You should be embarrassed, even though people aren't saying that, because obviously that'd be an awful thing to say. Um, just saying, keep it quiet. Don't talk about that. Nobody should know about that. That's not anybody's business. I think creates an atmosphere of secrecy and shame. And I just don't see the point of acting that way. He's a survivor of it. Even if he's still a child and he's still getting through it, he has survived it. And it should be looked at as like, just not something shameful. Like it just matter of fact, it happened and it has side effects. Some of those side effects can be being secretive. Some of those side effects could be major personality and behavioral issues. Could it be part, could it be like, and it can also make him more vulnerable to predator, predators in the future, okay? Which is what I'm looking at uh, a lot is like, and I, I really want to know, so I did find out from what Seth said on the Pascal show, they did take Sebastian's devices and still have them. So I hope that means that they're digging through them deeply. Um, and I I mean, if if they have and there's what they're saying is true, that there's no foul play, which I don't 100% believe, I think that they're building a case and no more than they're letting on because um, they don't have to tell the public the truth. They don't have yeah. to tell us the truth. Uh, they can lie and say that there's no foul play, but they know there's foul play. Yeah. Um, Which is totally fair I think it's, at, during a, yeah. an active investigation. I just, I, I always like clarifying because I'm one of, I, I advocate for total transparency a hundred percent, except in situations where it can, uh, can cause issues within the investigation, obviously, you know, and I think this could be one of those situations. I mean, you have, two parents or people that were in his life, the mother and the stepfather that is literally like on the road permanently right now and could go across state lines, go running, go whatever at any given time. Um, yeah, you know, I'm not a hundred percent where Katie is at this point, but I know I'm pretty sure Chris is at work. Um, I'm not sure if she stayed with him or not. Uh, but yeah, I just, I think that knowing that fact about Sebastian, it it gives much more insight, much more insight. What came out on that show, even though Seth came out on the Pascal show and says, look, I, I he had a moment. He He literally said he had a moment like he had lost it at that point. He was tired. He barely even remembers the show mm -hmm. because he was so out of it, so tired. Um, his arm, his, he has some kind of, and this whole thing with his arm that's going on, he says he doesn't know what happened to it. I do. It's called stress. He didn't have to injure it or pull a muscle for that to happen. You know, if you guys have never heard of like the stories where somebody is going through such immense stress, they lose the ability, they lose their ab ability to move a limb. Look yeah. into that. Yeah. <laughs> because stress can do incredible things to the body. Like, and by incredible, I mean awful <laughs> things to the body. Yeah, um, no, just absolutely wild, wild. I, I'm a huge advocate for that, that, that you need to do everything you can just to keep your stress down. Whether you're the type of person that's jealous, whether you're the type of person that gets frustrated easily, that you're the type of person that gets angry easily, all those feelings that cause stress, you're literally shaving like years off your life. It's just not worth it. It is not worth it, you know, because oh. of how dangerous stress is. So I just randomly saw somebody ask if Katie was in the military. Yes. And I believe I personally believe that's how 
Katie and Chris Proudfoot met. I because they both lived in San Diego and were both in the Navy. And Seth said that Chris was in the picture before they were ever divorced. Mm. Um, so I think that's definitely how they met. Well, one thing I heard recently, and I'm trying to remember where it came from. I think it came from Seth, but maybe somebody who talked to Seth that Katie uh, is like trained in some kind of fighting. Like ju 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 say it for me. Yeah, jujitsu. There you go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or something like that. Something like that. Mm -hmm. That she's trained in like some fighting techniques and yeah. um, that she's kind of a BA when it comes to that, which I thought was kind of interesting. I would just to be know curious she doesn't what, look like that. I would just be curious what fighting though and where Me that too. training came from because the military uses they don't teach some that minor jujitsu moves and grapples and things like that but they use like you know a, a variety a blend of it the whole yeah. goal when you're in the military is to not let people get within arm's reach so um you know it i see somebody on here say that it's Bra brazilian jujitsu so um yeah it and it yeah what is that? So what is the Brazilian part of it? Oh, matter? gosh, we could go into it. I mean, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is just made famous by a Brazilian family that is very well heard of. Uh, and they have an entire lineage of like five decades worth of uh, fighters that have led in these action fighting sports. But way off topic here. Um, it's just certain types of moves for essentially coming from that family. Oh, okay. Yep. What the heck? So, the spider. Well, that's that's good to know. Um, but yeah, that's just something randomly that I had heard um recently, which I thought was kind of interesting because she could doesn't be interesting, but that I that it doesn't could be point another, towards guilt. Right. It, that could be another I'm not one saying of that for that reason. Topics that like look it. It's interesting, I guess. The re I guess the reason why it could be interesting in this case is because um, people who are fighters um, usually are very confident. One of the best things you can do for yourself or your kids is get them in some sort of fighting or defense class. Not to hurt people, but to defend themselves. Well and it overall builds a level of confidence. Now, when you transition that or or instill that kind of confidence and physical confidence into somebody that is already criminally minded or more willing and uh, a, a more a more likely participant to to be in the criminal world, um, well, maybe that it maybe it it, it has some place and and would be interesting in in understanding kind of how that works. But I don't think that being a BA in any fighting style makes you more or less likely to commit a crime of this nature. Well, and I, think, I also think it could, there could be an argument made that it makes it less likely because of what's oh, taught in martial arts. I don't. Martial arts is, uh, fighting styles usually, don't make you a more of a good person or worse. I, I, I understand that, but I see I could see an argument because it teaches like discipline and control. Oh uh, yeah, but and they usually do teach you like to you know not use what you're learning unless that per if unless you're defending yourself. My my big issue in this case, I'm gonna be completely honest uh, with everyone is. For whatever reason, you guys, and I haven't been able to pinpoint it yet, and I have not been able to watch enough interviews for me to fine tune my opinion as to why. But when, and it could be bias. I want to be clear with you. My, my, what I'm seeing here could be bias. But when I watch the stepfather and birth mother talk, um, I see an overwhelming amount of ego and inability to be wrong in any situation, even down to the micro expressions when they're asked yep. questions in interviews. Yep. And understand that is a very subjective statement. There is absolutely no is. evidence backing what I just said. I am 100% completely making that assumption based off of my experience as a salesperson and reading body language and micro expression when I'm, you know, trying to pitch something to somebody. When I, when I watch them, um, 
I get a an overwhelming feeling that they just don't have the ability to have their ideas questioned. And that's interesting. And and part of the reason I feel like that is like the um Chronicles of Olivia. Chronicles of Olivia. Um, right? That's what it's called. Mm -hmm. Interview. When, yep. And she interviewed them. And uh, there's a couple places in there where you could tell the way that the question was asked or presented, they weren't happy with. And the 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 quick snap back and reaction of being offended, I was like, whoa, that is strange. That means they're already like pre pre defensive before even coming into that interview why is somebody already defensive before coming into that interview i don't think that they have been they have had red flags thrown at them at that point to the extent that they are now for whatever reason in the last two weeks weeks it's really ramped up in my opinion yeah so the interview that i felt like i feel like the chronicles of olivia interview was much more um relaxed the one that i felt the most like they were snapping back and on the defense the whole time was the one um gosh what is what is that channel's name the story smiley stories smiley stories i think is what her youtube name is uh and they know. there was no video of them so they just hopped on her live um, on like stream yards or we something sure and there that. was no picture of them it was only them talking and it was showing like a little blank thing you know and they she asked them questions is that yes that okay. is her channel and shout out to her i think she did a really good job like getting them open, like opened up to talk because i learned a lot in that interview like that interview was wild. And if you guys have not heard it, I suggest you go listen to it yep. because he so, details his CPS suggestion. stuff, um, which he then lied about later on Nancy Grace um, and, and many other things that I'm failing to detail right now because it was so much. It was such a long interview and it was so much information. Um, and I just watched it earlier today and it's a lot. It is a lot. But I highly recommend recommend it and this is um, the other creator that we talked about just a minute ago i just want to make sure we're giving people the yeah credit where credit's due for sure yeah the credit one thing that credit. i found really really interesting was uh one thing i noticed in watching these interviews today between chronicles of olivia and smiley stories um and i interview. think this is the last creator that we highlighted when we were talking about this story so all yeah, right. but so. one thing that I saw was Chronicles of Olivia saying on court TV that her like partner or something like that, when they went to interview the Proudfoots, he went into Sebastian's room that she didn't get the chance to do it because uh, Katie was showing her pictures and stuff and they ran out of time. But her partner went into Sebastian's room with Chris and that it was very clean, like pristine. The whole house was pristine and Sebastian's room was very clean. Mm -hmm. Well, in the Smiley Stories interview, Katie said that Sebastian's room was always messy. Okay. And then, but the rest of their house was very clean. So, um, and it so was explain. always very clean. And then, how chris that. christopher when he, they're asked about that and they're talking about that he's like wait why are you asking that question he was like are you trying to imply that we like cleaned up to like try to cover something up and there was no talk of that at all and she's like no no like uh, you know I, so assumptively you know, she's, defensive and literally she, like that was I, I could tell that wasn't her intention i think her intention of asking that question was her son was autistic and there's differences in types of autistic children okay and i think she was trying to get a feel was it abnormal like did he typically keep his room clean or did he was it typically messy and was it different the day he went missing mm -hmm. because that would could be a you know some kind of clue like if his room was messy does that mean somebody came in there i 
Look, I was think there that a struggle? Is massive. It is like, a massive deal. So yeah, for him to be like, are you guys trying to are you trying to suggest that we tried to cover something up and clean something up? I was like, whoa, that was really defensive and kind of weird for him to like butt in and be like, you know, ready yeah. to fight about it. And, and I, I, my big question is, uh, if it was messy and dirty, why did they clean it up? Well, see, the whole thing I've been hearing about Sebastian the whole time is that Sebastian kept a tidy room, that he liked things tidy. Okay. But I'm hearing it was messy. And okay. his mom is saying it always was messy. And then when Olivia went to go interview them a couple weeks after he went missing, his room was pristine, clean. Me and they said that the cops had like tore it up for searching and everything. So basically, if it was a crime scene, if that little boy's room was a crime scene, it has been ruined because they cleaned it up. So because when Olivia went there, it was clean. OK, so but it was I, I'm messy. trying to understand how that could happen uh, from a good faith perspective. So let's say the room was clean not not dirty right there's a big difference between dirty and messy let's say the room was messy right uh, classic they think he had add or uh wasn't he just like recently um what diagnosed with uh autism wasn't it literally just recently they got the diagnosis I don't they know. thought he had adhd at first or something anyways people uh that have like learning disabilities, whether it's ADHD or whether it is autism or whatever, uh, a lot of times it seem very messy in the way that they keep their things, but they know exactly where everything is because it's their mess. It's like a, cho a chosen mess, right? You're, you're controlling that mess. You know where it is. You know that you have it's this contained pile. contained chaos. Over yeah, this contained pile chaos. is all of this stuff. This pile is all of this stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but my my question is, was it clean and did it become messy because the police searched through the room and that's why it was clean again? Is there a good faith reason here where it was clean, police messed it up searching, and then they cleaned it because yeah. police messed what? it up searching just to give the flip side of the coin? Yeah. And I mean, there was that story about how Seth said Sebastian's room was super messy in California and he told him to clean it up and he went and clean it up and he made a bigger yeah. mess. So it does kind of go against this idea that he liked things tidy. Like, yeah. I don't know how true that is. Okay. Um, but that's I don't know. It's just it was a weird thing that struck me. I'm like, OK, what is the truth here? Like everything else in this case, like what is the truth? You know, with the dogs, like Chris also said in the Smiley Stories interview, he was going to clear up the dog thing like, you know, period. Like, this is what it is. Um, he didn't do that because he claimed that it hit at a construction site, like in basically the neighborhood where all the construction was going on mm -hmm. at a retention pond and that they drained it and found nothing. OK, well, I'm, I'm really glad that they drained it. Um... It was only knee deep when it before it was drained. Too. Well, one thing I want to clarify, though, that bothered me is in one of the interviews. And I wish I I wish I kept all my notes perfectly presentable, you guys. And I had everything exactly where I want it and it should be. But I don't. So I apologize for that. But in one of the interviews, the stepdad says, uh, look, it they're looking for him uh what was that statement about not being smart enough share that not being smart enough yeah he said like look if if it was me do you really think i'm smart enough to outsmart all what oh, okay. was that so so christopher proudfoot said in the um was it it was either Smiley Swords or Chronicle of Olivia sorry i'm getting them mixed up right now cuz they're both really long and i watched them both today um, and was trying to look at contradictions and things like that. Well, one thing Christopher Proudfoot said was that this case is really like odd because, or no, 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 no. He started with, if we had something to do with this, like, do you really think we could outsmart all of these different agencies? Like, he's like, you know, name 
name the agency. They're involved in this case. Like we could not outsmart all of these different agencies, but that's the weird thing about this case is this 15 year old boy is like Houdini and he did, he did outsmart all of them. And this case is going to be used like as to be studied. It's like basically okay. going to be an example case. Yeah. And, and that stands out to me. And the reason being is because that is like, a double negative comment where he's claiming let's just pretend that he's involved okay do you understand the satisfaction that he could get by being like you know uh, of course it's not me i mean i couldn't be smarter than all of these agencies and and outsmart all of these agents when i know you, I know you I, are right. I so really, it's it. just an ego stroke in a situation. And again, I'm not saying he's guilty, you guys. I'm just saying that statement stood out where I was like, OK, that's a really weird thing to say, because anybody with any experience into investigations knows it has absolutely nothing to do with being smart. OK, it is what you can find and what dots you can connect it like intelligence, IQ, how smart you are means nothing absolutely nothing it's who has the most data who can gather the most information and data and make that information connect it doesn't matter how smart you are so that it it was just strange it was strange it made me feel weird it made me think like you know how many times i've watched interviews one on one interviews where like serial killer type dudes have made comments like that well you don't really think I could do this. You know what I mean? Where it's literally stroking their ego ego while simultaneously manipulating the person in front of them. You know, mm -hmm. it's interesting. It's it is, definitely interesting for sure. It, it was very, very interesting. Um, and I felt really weird about it when he said it. I'm like, yeah. So you think Sebastian could outsmart all of these different agencies? Right. Next but that so. you couldn't? So now he thinks that he, that he did run away, like there's an intent to run. Yeah, and I found it really, I mean, after all of this, you know, what's been going on with Sebastian's case, it's almost made me, like, look, I don't want to point fingers at Chris and Katie because sometimes I do look at their situation and I'm like, I mean, I, I try to look at it from everyone's perspective. I, I really do try to do that. Um, and I try to stay in the middle and be unbiased. But there's a ton of red flags that's got me looking at them like him backing out of the polygraph. OK, that is a big deal. That is not a good look. Um, <laughs> it just looks really bad. I just I for the life of me can't understand why they've made the decisions that they have. Um, and it makes me almost wonder, is it intentional calling him a runaway? Because, you know, runaways don't get as much airtime. Like, they don't get as much investigation from the cops. Now, this case, I think, is getting quite a bit of investigation. And I hope that I'm right that the cops know more than um, they're letting on. I really do. But I wanted to look at, so there were some things that uh, Katie said in that interview too. Like, so did you know Sebastian was still wearing pull-ups? Well, interesting thing is that is a symptom of SA. So, and he not would, surprising. he would go through these periods of regression. Again, another symptom of and SA. I find it really interesting. She's really willing to talk about him having accidents and kind of poke fun at his dancing, but is so offended by Seth talking about him being essayed. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I, that goes back to what we said originally, this culture of uh, like keeping that stuff hidden. You guys, if, if any of you have ha are victims of abuse as a child um my one thing i can suggest to you uh just because of my own personal struggle with being abused when i was younger it is share it with anyone and everyone take all the power out of that man you know i don't like this culture of well that should be a family secret you know that shouldn't be talked about out loud M maybe not to the whole world i get that argument but it shouldn't be a secret either right it doesn't whoever's a victim 
of SA. Um, it's not their fault. So why is why should anyone so, be embarrassed? Yeah. So it's here's, not their fault. Here's another thing. So there was the bedwetting and the regression. Um, you know, where he'd have issues wetting the bed. Apparently, she said Seth said that that didn't happen at his house. Um, but she said, I know of a couple times that it has. Only a couple times that it has? Wait, a couple times that it happened at his house? At Seth's house, but it mostly happened at her house well, where he would have these issues. That's really interesting. So, And she said this, not Seth, on the Smiley Stories interview. Now... I wanted to go through some signs. Well, one thing also that Seth mentioned in the Pascal interview last night was, and they were talking about this whole situation, how Chris didn't want Sebastian around his daughter, okay? And, you know, also talking about, like, how Sebastian was about to come live with him and all, all of these things, because it, it sounded like a lot of things were about to change. Sebastian was about to go live with his father full time. Um, and, you know, Chris was still going through his custody battle. I, I just really wonder if that has something to do with all of this. I've wondered that from the um, beginning, too, that they're worried secrets could come out. Yeah. And the if fact that could be a motive. And. Here. We know, and Seth also said that Chris was threatening to tell everybody about what happened to Sebastian because he, this is what, Seba what this is what Seth said. Okay, he said that Katie and Chris were on the phone with him, and Chris told Seth, "Look, people are asking why I don't want Sebastian around Faith, and basically was threatening I'm gonna tell him." And so Seth, I guess, wanted to beat him to the punch and tell everyone because he didn't feel like it was fair. And Katie was on the phone hearing all this. And he said, look, if I tell him they're not going to want to search for him anymore, like nobody's going to want to search that for Sebastian anymore if they know he's a pedo, basically. A predator, which is an awful thing to say about a little boy who was traumatized. It's an awful and thing abused. to say about anybody who's been abused. And under I say that understanding that the statistic around people that have been a victim are, is really high. I have a personal opinion on that. I think that when it is not worked through and not made open, you know, open conversation and talked about that little seed of abuse uh, starts growing roots and taking and taking you over, which is what I, which makes me super sad watching this situation and how it already feels like it's a manipulation and abuse of secret information. Okay, if everyone knows, who cares? Then you can work through it. You know what I mean? Yeah, Come and it's on. it is messed up to to threaten to put it out there like Agreed. that. And and that goes against what anything Katie said. If that is true, then Katie come can't come out here and act like she's on some moral high ground. Like, oh, how dare you tell everyone that about my son? If your husband, you were on the phone co-signing him threatening to say it to the world. Like if you were okay with your husband saying it, then what's wrong with Seth saying it? And in a way that he did it where, you know, talking about how Sebastian needs help and they were going to get him help. And they finally were getting a therapist that could help him. And he was going to go live with Seth. He also talked about he didn't how Sebastian told him that he didn't feel like Chris and Katie liked him because all they did was yell at him. And we're going to play a little clip, you guys, that I meant to play last night on the True Crime Talk Show, where um, it's a very small, small clip, okay? It's a very small taste, but I feel like it says, it speaks volumes to me. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we'll play that here in a little bit. It was bit. surprising to me. Yeah, but... Seth said one situation that happened was Sebastian went in a bathroom and pulled out his private okay. part yep. and said, this is mine. What does yours look like? Or something like that. Okay. Trying uh, to compare with other children. Yeah. Okay. And what? And Chris made that out to be like a thing that is predatory are you serious and seth was saying look i was a kid like that's a pretty normal kid thing to do uh yeah that's really normal it like, is really and normal. it is not a sign of pred predatory behavior no i i have actually looked into this before because 
I thought a child in my family a long time ago, my that could have been a sign of like looking, okay, showing and looking. And I started looking into it, and that is not a sign, dude. So that actually is a guys, pretty normal, but... curious little kid thing to do. You just talk to them about it. In, it's something that just needs to be talked in about. In junior high, we were issued showers, okay? And this is Southern California, you guys. And uh, in junior high, kids were already taking showers openly after PE. Now, it wasn't a requirement, so you didn't have to. But, like, nudeness and being around other people of your own gender completely normal even though nowadays i've heard that schools don't offer showers after pe or anything like that they did it one time there is nothing strange about that you know i understand that i am a kid a child of trauma um but when my my brain blacked that out okay and how I was is you couldn't keep my clothes on me as a child. And it wasn't done in any like sexual nature. I literally just thought it was funny. I would go running down the street nude at like, you know, 11 and 12 year old years old because I it I liked people being shocked. Yeah. And we had like a giant family get together where all my family was there, like family you only see once every five years. And for whatever reason, I went in the bathroom, took off all my clothes and walked out naked in front of everyone. Like I was that kid. So I don't think it's that strange. Uh, now, I'm mine I don't know. over the top. It's, I get it's it. over the I, top. I, I, I don't understand know. <laughs> mine's over the top. I'm not saying what I did was normal. But what I'm saying is. I was open in that way and it wasn't there was no sexual nature to it. You're saying you weren't becoming a predator because of that. That's no, not a there's sign no of... sexual nature yeah. to it. Okay. It wasn't for any arousal or anything like that. It was just because I didn't care if people saw me naked and other people did care and I thought it was funny. That was the only reason. So I don't think it's weird with a a child being curious like that and you don't continue this behavior as an adult in public yeah <laughs> i do it every day i just <laughs> after every stream strip off my clothes and go running naked absolutely i put on my smiley face mask and go running naked <laughs> no joke obviously <clears throat> he said like 11 like basically around Sebastian's age, maybe a little younger, like yeah, eleven in that range. Yeah. Um. I mean, there were a lot of events, you guys, where clothes felt felt like it hindered me. Now there was this, so they were building homes where I lived, uh, like track homes, and they cleared this giant field, and it got it was like real soft dirt and got super muddy. And I think I was like eight or something like that. But we went out and we're like having a mud day out there. And I immediately took off my clothes because I didn't want the weight of the mud on my clothes. So for me, it was just like a normal thing. I don't know. Maybe I'm just weird and that's totally possible. But I don't think I that do think that it's pe like kids curiosity like that is an issue, you know? No, the curiosity of what someone else's looks like is not yeah. predatory. It is not even sexual. But like it, they, it's they, sad it was used that way. Yes, it is sad. Mm -hmm. And Katie even said she thought Sebastian was starting to like girls, but he was in denial about it, even though he was 15. He was not 15 in his mind. He was a little bit younger because of the things he's dealing with, like autism and his chromosome deletion. He he wasn't like 15 totally in his head. So while oh, he probably had I crushes wonder. on girls, um, he wasn't ready to admit that. He wasn't comfortable with that yeah. is what she said. Um, so, I mean... Which is I don't know. That's strange. Um, but Why is he that had strange? some issues. I I don't I don't remember ever being like shy to admit I was into uh, girls. That just feels strange. At, so like, you're saying at any age, yeah, that's at any not age, normal. At any age. That's 
probably because of what happened to the, him, then I would assume. I, I you got to remember, same thing happened to me. Yeah. But the difference is, and I have no idea about him. He has right? additional things he's dealing with on top of it. Yeah, and I don't know if gender matters in abuse too you know what i mean so um i don't know if that changes things i was abused by a female family member much 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 older um adult well, i don't think that's what it is i mean it would depend on what you're i'm not saying there's anything wrong either way what i'm saying is that do those different variables change the way that that trauma uh perceives itself or or, or presents itself you know what I mean? Is that possible? <laughs> not not that it matters. I I don't I don't see any difference there. It wouldn't matter to me at all. I'm just saying, does it change something like that? You know, yeah. today's age, probably not, because you know, who cares if someone's gay? Literally, like it who cares? Great. You like who you like. It is what it is. You know what I mean? But uh, when I was younger, it wasn't necessarily there yet. So maybe that could have changed how my trauma presented. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. It's interesting, though. And I do think it's so, interesting that he was shy to admit he was interested in girls. Hmm. Yeah. Um. Okay, so what are some signs that a kid has been abused? Okay, let's read through some of these yeah. based off what we know about Sebastian. And is this a spe specified abuse or just abuse in general? It's sexual abuse. Okay. Uh, the child is quieter or more distant than usual. The child is clingier than usual. Mm -hmm. um, Sebastian had no personal boundaries at all. He didn't understand them, which is probably because of autism. Um, unusual or new fears, sometimes around touch, being alone, being with a particular person or in a particular place. He didn't want to go to his mom's house. I don't know if that was a fear, but it sounded like he would become very frustrated about it. Uh, difficulty concentrating or with memory, zoning out, seeming distracted or not listening. Eating, sleeping, or hygiene changes. Um, it sounded like Sebastian never slept. And it sounded like that was an issue with him from the time he was a baby, um, which may not be a sign of abuse at all. It could be his normal. Because um, yeah, my normal was like that. I well, literally needed only like four hours of sleep my whole life. I barely ever needed sleep. That's funny because now what I need more. That's what Seth said is as a baby, he only slept for four hours. I barely needed any sleep at all. And I was a hundred going, man. And um, I didn't, I didn't do naps. I couldn't do naps. None of that. Well, Sebastian, I guess, I had a lot of issues sleeping and actually Katie started getting him sleeping meds to get him to go to sleep. Um, and he ate a lot and he would get up in the middle of the night and eat lots of snacks and lots of sweets was and he junk. On, um, uh, not tramadol. Uh, I don't know what the medication was. Not toradol either. Uh, shoot, it's it's a widely known one. Um, and that that's a tramadone, trazodone, trazodone. I don't yeah. know. Trazodone, and it pff, knocks you out, dude. It is I insane how good that works. But the symptoms are that you wake up in the middle of the night and uh, eat so 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 much. Hmm. Interesting, right? It is interesting. So what was he on some medications like that? I'm not sure. He was on sleeping meds. I just don't know what one. Like it I I've heard some questions oh, yeah, asked the parents about yeah. the medications yeah. he was on and how he shouldn't stop them abruptly mm -hmm. or else um it, he could have like a seizure. Like it, it's something he needed to wean off of. Because it could be dangerous to just like get off of them. Mm -hmm. But other than that, it wasn't like he didn't need them, but it would, he would have issues if he didn't have them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was definitely more than melatonin. He was on some, like some kind of prescription med for sleeping. Yeah. From what but, I saw. All right, let's keep going. Through um, because I, I think we could see some evidence here. I just have a feeling that. Look, maybe he wasn't abused his whole life, you guys. But what if 
after that situation, the stepfather started having resentment, knowing that they were trying to get his daughter living there. I don't you know, know what I mean. I wonder like, that too. That I do. That kind of abuse can come up come later. So here's the next one. Regressive behavior such as bedwetting or soiling after being toilet trained, acting or wanting to be treated like a baby uh, slash younger child again. So this is definitely one Sebastian had. Um, who knows? I mean, again, th there's some issues here with identifying some of these because of his conditions, you know, um, his autism and chromosome deletion. Um, there's some issues here with that, but this is a big one for abuse for SA for a lot of kids, uh, especially at his age. Yeah. yeah. And considering the abuse was many years ago, do you think it's odd that he was still presenting these if he were getting help as Katie said? So, like I said, I, I truly think where that that victim turns offender comes from is from people that have been abused uh, or had has that trauma that and they don't work through it. Yep. So I, I don't know. Maybe it could have happened once and it was so severe that it stopped his development dead in its tracks and continued like that for multiple years i think anything is possible i've seen a couple people saying here that the symptoms can be passive they can be very upfront in your face and aggressive symptoms i that's a great point you're right there is no one size fits all with this there tends to be some uh symptoms or signs that we see that that are that present themselves in, in the majority of cases, but not every situation is one size fits all. Everybody deals with their trauma different. And yes. like me, it no matter how many therapists, psychologists or whatever you would have took me to, my brain blocked it l black. Like it didn't happen, dude. I, I remember being like, 11 and 12 and you know when you're talking with your friends like oh yeah i can remember from this age i had no memory from like six back none so your first six years of life you couldn't remember yeah at all. nothing nothing and i always thought that was weird i was like well maybe i'm just too young you know whatever and once i once that memory of that trauma did come to me in my mid 20s um I, I could remember back that far. It like it's like it opened up a floodgate. It was really strange. That is really strange. Yeah. It's really weird how the brain does that. Um, but it definitely does. So the next one is showing knowledge of sexual behavior beyond their dev de de developmental age. Um, sexual themes and artwork, stories, play, etc. Acting out behaviors such as aggression, destructive behaviors, taunting behavior. So I haven't heard that he had any knowledge beyond his age. I haven't heard any stories about him having sexual themes and artwork or play or stories or anything like that. Now, I have heard I that he would get... I stepdad thought that, though. There has to be a reason why. I have heard that he was aggressive and through tantrums, even at 15 years old, that he was still throwing temper tantrums yeah, but and getting like aggressive, people? not hitting. He they from what Chris and Katie said is he would never get violent to the point where he would hit anybody, but he would growl and throw tantrums and growl. like, yes, Whoa. and put his hand like ball up his fist and stamp his feet and as long as he's not hurting anyone, yell. no, like whatever. Yeah, but he would get like aggressive and like kind of like really angry and throw temper tantrums. Okay, okay. So I, like, I don't know if I would say that's a major red flag personally, but uh, I, the way I look at it is like, who cares how you get your frustration and anger out as long as you're not hurting a person place or thing you know or animal or something like that so and it didn't sound like feet. he did any Yell. of that like who cares you know yeah 
Yeah. The fact that he was really kind and loving to animals uh, is also a big indicator to me that he was a sweetie, not a predator. But um, I'm just curious, like I said, why the stepdad thinks that I want to know if he thinks that because of his own past experiences in life or if something additional happened. Were there signs of this that just hasn't come out yet? Right. You and, know? you know, that the whole temper tantrum thing, I think, is heavily can be explained by autism. Um, I don't think it's necessarily a sign of abuse. But, yeah, I do also wonder, are there signs or symptoms that were going on that we just don't know about? Uh, and it's very possible. But even if he was showing any of these signs, it doesn't mean he was becoming a predator. Yeah. Part of the reason I'm wondering that, too, is because, <clears throat> look, if I'm the stepdad and I need some kind of justification for doing something awful and despicable to a child. Could that have been a justification in him doing what he did? Yeah, because this is what I'm he's going to become the world. This is what he's from... going to become and he's going to hurt people. Yeah. I wonder that, too. I do. Um, so acting in behaviors, withdraw from friends and family, depression, problems with friends and schoolwork and attendance, vague symptoms of illness such as headache or tummy ache and self-harm, uh, cutting or risky behavior, asking vague questions or making vague statements about topics such as secrets, unusual games or adult behaviors. Um, and this comes from the bravehearts.org. Um, this is actually an Australian website. Yeah. But they have a 1 800 number for people that need support, which is nice. You should uh, pull up that video. Um, yeah, I will. I, I just have to send something real quick. So if you want to pull this up. Yeah, I can. Um, but I, I wanted to say, while I think there's some signs there from what we know that he was still dealing with the trauma, because that's really what it comes down to for me. Is like Katie's claiming she's done everything she can to get him help. And while I know doing everything you can as a parent to get your child help doesn't always mean that things are going to go perfect perfectly or that the kid's going to get over it. Um like he could still be having issues even if she did get him all the help that he needed. But from what Seth is saying, it sounds like she was getting him help by getting him a therapist, but it wasn't somebody who could actually help with the trauma. Do you know what I'm saying? So was he becoming increasingly difficult to deal with because he was a young boy with autism, a chromosome deletion, an ADHD, and trauma who's growing up and becoming their own person. Like, kids push boundaries no matter if they have any of these issues. They're going to grow up. They're going to push boundaries. They're going to become rebellious. Um, they're going to be little jerks sometimes. Uh, but... And it doesn't make him a bad kid. Like, none of this makes him a bad kid. Uh, I, I feel really bad for him because I I don't feel like he was getting all the help that he needed. Um, but it makes you wonder, like, how... And it's not his fault. But how difficult was he becoming to manage? And could that be an indicator at all of what happened to him? It Could that be a clue at all? of either him making a choice of his own volition or becoming another vulnerable target to another predator or a victim at the hands of parents who are at their wit's end. And I think the question about, you know, I mean, I it's weird. He was going to live with his father, you know, so like, why, why? Why do any anything like why did this happen? He was about to go live with his dad and he was finally getting help and everything. So why would Chris and Katie do anything? I don't know. I, I truly don't know. One thing that I found interesting is that and I'm really glad I watched this because we were just asking questions about the insurance um, 
because Seth mentioned on a podcast that he had the Gerber grow up plan, which is life insurance on Sebastian uh, from the time he was a baby, which if you guys haven't heard of, it's an amazing thing. And I think that any parent should have it on their child because it can be really beneficial. Like it can be money your kid can later get in life or they can continue it and have a hefty size life insurance plan for their family if something happens to them. Um, there's a lot of benefits to it, a lot. But Smiley Stories asked Katie if they had life insurance on Sebastian and she avoided the question and instead said, well, Seth has life insurance on him. And I really wish Smiley had dug deeper and said, well, I didn't ask if Seth did. I asked if you did, if you or Chris had life insurance on him, but she didn't. Uh, but I thought that was interesting that she was ready to point at Seth and not mention, not say no, like, no, we don't have life insurance or yes, we do. Like, hello, why not? Why not just be up front? Why did you deflect and point the finger at somebody else? It doesn't look so great. Just saying. But yeah, I'm going to try to pull up this video really quick. Um, I recently came across it on TikTok. It was being posted and passed around. And people have been reposting it and reposting it and talking about it because... I got to admit, it's kind of interesting. Um, the rumors, the claims that have been made about the Proudfoots, you know, Chris's family, his sisters, uh, their involvement in the whole situation with his ex-wife, Nina, and things like that. They, they're not great, okay? They're not great. So it's in this, you're going to hear one of Chris's sisters, one of Sebastian's step-aunts, step, step aunts, uh, talk to him. And you're going to hear Sebastian's voice. And um, it's, I don't know, I, I'll just let you guys decide what you think of it, I guess. But hold on just a minute. Wait, is it okay saying? if it pulls up on the TikTok website? Is that okay? Mm, I, I, I can try. I don't know. Or do you? Or do you want me to send like the actual video video? Yeah, send the video. Uh okay. <clears throat> that makes it take longer, just so you know. Okay. Safer. Well, hold on just a second. I mean, there's no music or nothing. Yeah. But, uh, and, and just to be clear, you guys, too, uh, so like we said in the beginning, and I'm going to keep making this claim, that we have no say one way or the other who's guilty in this situation, but it is our job to suggest law enforcement look into these specific areas. I truly believe it is our job to uh, hold law enforcement accountable. Um, you know, our tax dollars pay for those institutions. So uh, if I'm paying for it, I'm not doing it out of the kindness of my heart. I'm doing it because it is my duty as a citizen in the same way that it is my duty as a citizen to make sure these institutions are doing what they should be doing. Right. And that comment that we started talking about earlier where uh, the stepdad was making a claim that, look, we have every agency under the sun looking for him. Okay, great. But that other half of the comment, and that is great, but the other half of the comment that nobody could outsmart them, that I'm sorry, that's just not true, okay? Uh, we don't know at what capacity every agency is in there. Now, if you tell me that there are like an, an FBI workforce size group of agents working on this yeah it's much harder to trick them right they have state-of-the-art technology and uh, they actively use it their technology experts are actual experts the knowledge they have is industry leading that is hard to compare and or find in any other place um now 
I don't think that's what's happening. I just like I don't think the FBI agents were involved in Idaho 4. I think that their technology was used and they were sent uh you know suggestions or or they were sent evidence uh, for them to use their technology to, uh, you know, discover. So in that capacity, I think there's only, the only thing we're going to find is anything that there's evidence on. Right. And, uh, I, I do think it's strange that there is no, no scent trail of him leaving the house. And, you know what? That's a really good topic to dive into is the reliability of scent dogs. So I don't know if everyone is a dog person in here or not, but if you haven't looked into the reliability of scent dogs, you really should. Because the fact that they can't find a trail, a scent trail is bonkers bananas i mean it is absolutely absurd that they can't find a scent trail here it is so uncommon um and unlikely that the only other option is that potentially someone had him wrapped in something and carrying him out otherwise our own shoes leave a scent trail that dogs can pick up and here's just an example <clears throat> In one of the cases of what people think could be smiley face, this Good. boy, okay, hang on. This boy had been missing 70 days, okay? And he was put in the water and traveled an unknown amount of distance in the water. He was in the water for multiple months, like three months, and he ended his body ended up landing on an island all right and scent dogs found a trail up on the bridge of this boy they put the scent dog in a boat and the scent dog guided them to the body in the middle of the water they literally followed the scent trail on the water you guys to the body that was on this little landmass island that was surrounded by water, and he had been there for multiple months. So, scent dogs are so reliable and accurate. So reliable and accurate, you guys. Here's an interesting fact. A trained search dog can detect a mere three particles of human scent per trillion particles of air. Wow. That's incredible. It is. And, and the fact the, that he supposedly left barefoot. Right. It that's what I even it, it doesn't I, make look, sense. Even if he left with shoes on, they would have picked yep. up a scent. Yep. You guys, I've used this uh, example all, a million times talking about Idaho 4, but I just blew off tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of skin cells and a dna machine could pick that out of the air you know who else can a dog scent can pick up that scent those cells that i just blew off my hand for who knows how long of an amount of time they can detect a scent almost 10 miles away who, and wait. even a follow a trail that's over a month old who charlie okay for do you guys remember charlie brown do you know what Charlie Brown is? And Snoopy? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the the stinky kid that oh, uh, yeah. has the dust always around him, that is like what is coming off of us without anyone being able to see, but a dog can. That is literally identical to it. Is we are we have a flood of yes, Linus. We have a flood of cells around us that are shedding off of our hair and skin and everything yeah. and scent. And dogs can smell that and pick that up. Mm -hmm. It is absurd they can't find a trail. that, and, and I can't help but say that makes my mind automatically go to somebody wrapped up in something that doesn't allow cells to come out i know because i was looking that up you guys i was looking i sent that to you on discord by the way in the in our 
private chat. Um, I was looking that up, and while there wouldn't be a great scent trail, theoretically there could still be a scent detected outside the home, even if he was carried and not covered in something, um, because he would still be shedding hairs and skin cells. I, I, that's why, I'm, yeah, absolutely. So it's I not mean, ideal. It's not great if he was carried out, but there still could be a he trail. He needs to be wrapped in something for there to not be, because yes, exactly. Um, and I did just post our Discord, Discord invite link, you guys. I didn't talk about this in the beginning. We have a Discord, a uh, few hundred people in there, and uh, we just continue the investigation and conversation completely free, and it's great. Uh, and we talk privately with people in there. We have voice lounges. We got everything. We got the whole shebang in there. And, uh, you know, if you want to continue the conversation, continue this chat, it is just a chat room that is free and will never cost anything. Um, and you can join it by downloading Discord and using this invite link. Not anyone can join. You got to have the invite link. Um, and if you don't know what Discord is, I suggest you hop on YouTube and you um, watch a uh, you watch a you're going to have to download it probably. Uh, oh. OK. Oh, well, maybe not. You watch a uh, Discord video. Giving a, a walkthrough or breakdown of Discord because it it can look a little confusing at first. I was confused when I first jumped onto it, um, but I did. I watched video, figure it out and wham bam good to go yeah um, it was hard to learn it was a little intimidating and hard to learn at first but it's a lot more simple than you think um and, and like once you get used to it you understand it and you don't have to get into all the extra stuff you know like it can be just a very simple chat room okay <laughs> and really if you just stick to the general chat you'll see most everything Thank you for coming out to celebrate with us today. Drop those oh, chips. Nice. Mm -hmm. Is that showing on the screen right now? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I gotta be able to hear it though. Boys, thank you for coming out to celebrate with us today. Can it be heard? Drop those Yeah, chips. it should be. Can you guys hear that? <laughs> I can't hear anything. <clears throat> All right, it looks like Red Team. Look on your phone. What? You have it pulled up on your phone. You should be able to hear. Oh, okay. Here. They they can hear it. Okay. We we can't. Unfortunately, that one was a miss. But Blue Team, that one was a hit. Boys, I thank you for coming out to celebrate with us today. Drop those chips. Blue Team, give it a nudge. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, it looks like Red Team, unfortunately that one was a miss. But Blue Team, that one was a hit. Yes. I know, it's a miss. This is our double chip. Okay, who's, that's you. Grab the double chip lands, it'll give you 20. So it's going to be 20. Okay, who's, that's you. 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 Okay, no, she doesn't. She can get whatever. All right, team. That double chip. That gives a four. Right. Oh. Oh. <laughs> that gives a four. What? I'm taking a video of. Yeah, that uh Yeah, I I I get what you're I get what you're pointing out there and uh just Well, Seth just said on the Pascal show he didn't feel liked by Katie or Chris and that all they did was yell at him. 
Um, the tone there, it was the, the tone. tone. Like, it was you're the tone. annoying me. Why are you talking to me? Uh, type tone, you know? Um, and that can make someone feel that way. I agree. Yeah. He seemed calm. He didn't seem yeah. like he was being extra. Um, it kind of makes it seem like it could be normal. And you guys, I just want to be clear. This is totally subjective, right? This is, is not evidence. This is not objectivity. And it, 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 it shouldn't be taken into account when we're trying to determine what could happen to Sebastian. But just looking at it using my experience in sales and relationships, he acted like it was normal being talked to like that. Like, I think even me as a kid... If I'm 10, 11, 12, and someone talks to me like that, I'd be like, excuse me? <laughs> yeah, of course what? you would. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I had a mouth on me. I, I was a different person, right? Yeah. But uh, I you totally sure would have been like, yeah, okay, what did I do, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I think I probably would have went and cried in the corner, honestly, if somebody talked to me like that. <laughs> Uh, I was a very sensitive child. I cried a lot, but I wasn't like a th fit thrower. Like I would just go to my room and cry. Um, I didn't throw a fit. If somebody hurt my hurt my feelings, I didn't throw a fit because that doesn't. I was. I I knew enough to know that throwing a fit makes all eyes on you, and that doesn't help you get what you want. Yeah. So I was the person that would be like. I'm going to tell you exactly what you want to hear and I know what you want to hear so that I can go do the other thing behind your back. You know, that, mm -hmm. that was me. Yeah. The, the video footage is not great guys. I really, when I saw that we actually had a video of Sebastian, I was really excited until it was that. And I was like, God, that sucks. Like, I wish I could have saw more Sebastian. I wish I could have heard more conversation. But the little bit that we heard said was him trying to interact with his aunt and then her just being totally annoyed that he's talking is what it sounded like to me. And I and they're doing something fun. Like, this should be a time where they're excited and happy and having fun. And she's like, eh? that's what it sounded like yeah. and i was like whoa like it that's just kind of like gross sounding yeah it, it sounded offensive like yeah i agree with you i agree uh i don't so, think there was uh anything of value there in the way that they communicated with him yeah yeah and knowing that you know he was telling his dad he didn't feel liked because all they did was yell at him it that's really super sad if he felt that way. Um, if if that's the reality of it. Um, and hit that like button, you guys, uh, and leave a comment under the video after we're done here. Uh, I always forget to say this, but I just remembered right now, so I wanted to get it out there. Um, you guys have been doing awesome. The amount of growth we've had in like the last few days has been absolutely insane. And it's all because of you guys. So just keep doing what you're doing. You thought writers are absolutely incredible. And the reason why we put in the effort that we put into this is for you. Um, so just keep doing you. Sorry. I didn't want to forget though. Yeah. And yeah, thank you for sharing the green hearts. That is Sebastian's favorite color. And that's become something, you know, that's kind of being spread around line is the green hearts and Sebastian strong, like all of that, which these things are important. Um, they're, they're important to get the message out there and spread awareness for sure. But yeah, I was just kind of thrown off um, by her tone with him. And it, it made me concerned. I, I just, there's a lot of signs here, I think, that could possibly make you think he could run off. However, when you look at the facts and you look at the fact that there's no scent trail, there's no video of him leaving the home. You know, even Chris said, so I, on this is another thing said on Smiley's, um, channel in their interview and she wanted to know how they knew he went out the front door well through process of elimination they said it would have to be a door he could lock himself from the outside 
because all the doors were locked that morning. When she got up and checked to see if Sebastian was there, all of the doors were locked. No sign of forced entry. No sign anyone ever came in that house that night at all. Mm. So they said by process of elimination, it would have to be the front door because that was the uh, one of two doors he could lock on the outside by himself. And the other door, and he was used to that door. That was their reasoning. He was used to going out that front door. So if he was going to sneak out, that'd be the door that he used, which is not true at all. I don't know what kind of logic that is. You know, um, what we haven't talked about is uh, before they found uh, Riley Strain, the stepfather tried potentially connecting the cases. That was interesting, making it seem like Riley Strain could have took him and left. I don't think that's what he was trying to say. Oh, he was what? That's not no. what he was trying Are to you say. Serious? This is not what he was trying to say. Oh, I don't agree. I think when you're trying to connect two missing people, that is, is exactly what you're trying to say. Because the person that would like a kid would not be the same person that would abduct an adult. Yeah, right. It, it doesn't make sense for it to be the same person. But he was trying to like... In that inner in the Chronicles of Olivia interview, he said he brought up Riley and was talking about how weird it was they both went missing around the same time and like you know that it was scary all this was going on at the same time. It was a little weird. But getting back to what I was saying, he also ruled out Sebastian leaving through his window. He said that there was a flower bed outside of his window. And by the way, right um Sebastian's window was facing the front of the house. <laughs> <clears throat> he yeah. had one window facing the front yard of the home look and that there was a flower bed there and that if he had went out on that flower bed he would have fell and got hurt and cried and they would have heard him and so his his stepfather essentially ruled out every door but the front door and every window but the front door like that's Bro, the only exit he could have went out i understand why they're not continuing to investigate the parents heavily i don't get it do you want to know something uh, because really the dogs interesting would have picked that up exactly Gosh. do you want to know something really interesting yeah they did not forensically test the parents home at all they did not do fingerprints. No black lights. They did not do any kind of luminol or black light testing or anything like that. Nothing. And how do we know that? Chris and Katie Proudfoot. He said he said he asked them to do it and they said no. Oh yeah, right, dude. Come on. What? But Seth also has commented on this and said he doesn't believe any of it has happened either. Yeah, he was there for the so. first three days. Either it, it, somebody just doesn't go missing. Come on, you guys. Like, look, I want to believe X Files reference, right? Aliens. Uh, I want to believe aliens are real, but that doesn't just that doesn't happen. Somebody doesn't just get up and leave and go missing from a house, walking barefoot, and not be able to be tracked. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Look, in, in a perfect world, do I hope he was so unhappy with that house that he ran away on his own? And he's safe somewhere? And he's going to be found? Yeah. Me too. I totally hope Me too. that. But statistically, it becomes less and less probable or likely by the day. Yeah. And the cops did search the home, you guys. I'm not saying they didn't search the home. They did. And they put they brought dogs in there. Which they didn't use any the forensic dogs, testing. The dogs the did hit in yeah. the home. Mm -hmm. So, yes, the home was searched. They used the dogs. They did no forensic testing. They did not take fingerprints. They did not use black lights. They did not test for blood. They did nothing of the sort at all. According yeah. to any of the parents mm -hmm. involved. Which is, if I was a parent, I would be concerned by that. I would say, I want you to check, like, the windowsill to see if there's any fingerprints or the door handles. You know, if there's no evidence anywhere else, like, that's the last place he was. Why would you not want that kind of testing? What if he invited somebody into Look, his I room? Agree. I agree. I've, <clears throat> I've said it from the beginning. Yeah. I, I just don't. 
I, I, I threw this theory out there last understand. night in that what if he was talking to somebody on Minecraft on his switch that night? OK, yeah. And they came over to his home and he allowed and them in. To... He allowed them in through the window or the front door. Yep. They come in and then something happens and then they wrap him up yeah. or something or carry him out, take yep. him out somehow. Put him in a car and he's gone. Look, there's a whole bunch of different ways that could happen. But yes, I think that is very real because they wouldn't, if he was talking to someone on his computer, tablet, whatever, uh, they would have no idea who that was unless they know what they're doing and looking at history of text and everything else. And that person could come in, uh, knock him out in some way while he's still alive uh, and carry him out in a duffel bag bag it, it, any amount of ways i the reason why i'm saying those specific details is i'm trying to think of ways that a dog wouldn't pick up a scent right a dog would not pick up a scent um and that could be one of them all right that could be one of them so ah it's interesting and yes he um, was very very verbal um his parents have said he is very smart and he was functioning. He just had issues with sh social things. He didn't understand boundaries. Um, but other than that, he was very smart and he functioned and he was verbal. Uh, he did speak. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. This whole thing is just such a mystery. It makes no sense. And when things don't make sense, there's usually a reason for that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, I I think people are asking good questions, even, you know, at the vigil today. It was really nice hearing the grandparents talk about Sebastian and some of the family stories, even though it's heart wrenching. Um, but they asked for the negativity to stop. And this is Seth Rogers parents. Uh, they asked for the negativity to stop and um, that if you're trying to just make money off of Sebastian to go away, basically, like if I you're going to come and search, I mean, look, I, then do I, it on your I, own God, without, a, without a without a without a GoPro. And um, yeah, I, I hate that term, though. I hate that idea that like how did, offensive you make money. Look at our news has been doing that since they were created. So this idea that making money for putting in our time to bring awareness to things that are important to us and the community is offensive in itself. That comment's offensive and trying to get people to stop getting the word out. That's what it does, whether it's intentional or unintentionally. That's exactly what it does. There's nothing Look, wrong with nobody's, making money. Nobody's time is free, okay? Like, the news does not cover any of these stories for free. They just don't. Everybody's paid. People deserve yeah. to get paid for their work. Mm -hmm. They can care about something and make money at the same exact time. Um, and while I understand where they're coming from and i have the utmost sympathy for their situation and it's horrible and i understand that people are upset because of a situation that happened today uh at the rally with a man being accused of coming there with a gun uh though he did have a gun he did not ever threaten anybody with it there's a video proof of that okay so if you guys heard that somebody showed up at the rally today with a gun and was threatening people it's not true there's a video that very clearly shows that is not true so and the man that is accused of doing that has been working very hard to search for sebastian for day like since day three or four mm -hmm. into his case yeah so i, I think, wish i lived in that area i think I would be out there and i would be too i think we have to be really careful jumping on a bandwagon okay because he's also front, back side to side he's also being accused of working for christopher proudfoot and while i think it's possible that people are doing things for them I, I would be careful to just accuse anybody of that, especially somebody who is has show, has shown no ties to him and is literally working with the Rogers family, not really the Proudfoot family. Everyone owns a gun. In he Tennessee. was at the vigil and he has been working with the Rogers family this whole time. 
we got to be careful just throwing accusations out there like that no, and jumping I, on I the agree. bandwagon. It, I think it's all it all depends on how it's presented. And and I said this yesterday and I'm going to say it again because you brought a whole before we move on here. You brought a whole bunch of topics up yesterday that in my opinion were very subjective, very gossipy, but very important to the community. These topics that are gossip and hearsay uh, and, and all subjective, opinionated information that can't be verified, they still need to be talked about. And I think that's one area that the true crime community does really good about, depending on who's covering and things like that. Every channel's different. I'm not saying one coverage is better than another, but when you get news, a lot of times they aren't talking about stories that are important important to a community of people or important to the story or important to nationally. They are uh, talking about like what seems like a direction the case is going to go in and sticking to it no matter what. You know what I mean? Yep. And so, but keep doing what you're doing, you guys. Share his picture everywhere. Um, and, you know, I, I you think have a it's our job to hold law enforcement accountable. And when I say holding them accountable, I am not talking about harassment. I am not talking about uh, anything offensive, aggressive, or anything like that. Accountability is open conversation and requesting that our politicians do what meet the need of the public. That we call in and say, hey, you know, law enforcement, I know you're about to hate me right after I suggest this, but I, I'm an expert in this topic. And I, I just wanted to suggest that you guys do this in this way. You might be able to find something on that technology that you didn't find before. You know what I mean? Like stuff like that is accountability, not <clears throat> harassment causing problems, uh, aggression or threats or anything like that right that we own the law enforcement we do we do yeah and and you know we can ask these questions without um without being disrespectful like we can ask these questions important questions and keep the pressure on without attacking um and unfortunately i think in this case some people haven't been so good at that but um that's what we're doing here you know we're i feel like we do a good job of it um we remain respectful while asking the hard and important questions uh and talking about all the gossip because this case is full of it you literally can't even touch on this case without touching on the gossip because it's so full of it if if we only talked about the facts which there are very few of there'd be literally nothing to talk about and i think that some of the drama going on is showing people's true colors, which can be an indicator of I what's going on I here. If I'd go there. I don't know. What, what does that even mean? Someone's true colors. The type of people they are? Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. And I think it can be <laughs> an indicator. It can, it can raise questions around what they're capable of but yeah but christopher people, people Proudfoot, make mistakes i don't like final language like oh look at someone made a mistake they're showing their true colors that's not fair that's not fair it's people a very common way of phrasing and it people can do something wrong and that doesn't mean that they're showing like oh they're really a monster <clears throat> you know I mean, it's a very common way of phrasing it because I do think there's situations in this that have been exposed that show somebody's not exactly I, the way they portray themselves to be. I, I hear you. And and for, at least for me, I, I don't care what's common or average. That's not important to me. Uh, I'm just worried about being offensive to people and not being willing to accept people's mistakes where they make them. Right. So people are going to make mistakes. That doesn't mean you're showing like you're some bad person. Uh, what what helps get over those mistakes are obviously just being open, honest, upfront and like, hey, I did this, you know, just clear the air. It is what it is. I made a mistake. I'm human. And um but uh just the the coverage on this case it's easy for people to get up in their emotions and feelings and it doesn't necessarily mean that they're 
a bad person by focusing on this. You know, I just get nervous saying that. I'm not trying to come at people. Different channels have different opinions and handle their content in different ways. And I just think it's important that we always redirect and focus on uh, the 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 victim or the person lost in this case. And it's not up to me to judge whether they're making uh, a mistake or not, you know? Okay. Well, I just think that a lot of things that have come out about Chris have not been very good and he hasn't addressed them. You know, yeah. in Chronicles of Olivia's, um, you know, interview, he said that he, if you have a question, ask him. He's all about it. He's here to answer all the questions. And there for a while, he was on Facebook responding to comments and he said things that were really strange, actually. And, um, you know, he seen, he was so open to questions from what he said, but he was super defensive. And now he's completely shut down and denied a polygraph. Um, and there's a lot of questions like, why are you backing out of a polygraph? Why are you not addressing all of the things that have come out about you? Like, if you made mistakes in your marriage, like just take ownership of it. It would make if he came out and was like, look, that was a super toxic marriage. And I didn't appreciate her putting that out there. But since it's out there. Yeah, a lot of that happened, but it doesn't mean that I did anything to my stepson. I still care about him and I want to find him like if he did that, I'd. I would yeah. feel much better about all of it. Is I, all I agree. I agree. It's about the communication. It's about transparency. And it's about, uh, you know, making decisions in the moment. I, I have no idea about any of that other stuff because it's so subjective. That's yeah. all. We, we just don't have anything confirming. The only thing that we have confirmation wise is that she, the, 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 the birth mother, uh, did very manipulative, horrible things to the birth father. That is 100% confirmed. All the gossip about the stepdad uh, is not confirmed. It's all verbal comments made. Why do you think uh, what Katie did to Seth is confirmed, but not what Chris Be did to Nina? Because there's a documented report showing the CPS case and uh, the... So... When you call into police and you have a removal order, which is what she had, that becomes public record. That removal order is is pretty common when something's going on between, uh, you know, a marriage or whatever, married people. And that is evidence and proof, right? It's on paper. It was conducted by law enforcement and CPS was involved. However, within that, there was no notes around the cps case there was no notes around the law enforcement <clears throat> report there was nothing else all the other details are word of mouth the only other confirmed thing that i know of is him being abused and the reason why i consider that confirmed is that the 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 father and the mother both said it happened so i consider that confirmed right yeah but all the other stuff is, in my opinion, not confirmed, but needs to be used as a red flag to look further into. That's all I'm, I'm getting at there is I until something is true, objective evidence, we got to be able to be open to there being manipulation. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah, I agree with you. So. But uh, we will keep. On this case, you guys, we talked about it for quite a while, and that's good. I think all of these details need to be covered and talked about. Um, but uh, we will get moving along here now. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Uh, hang on, I want to pull up this YouTube channel because uh, what what was it? Um, Hang on, hang on, hang on. Because they've been in our chat a few times, and I want to, I want to, okay, okay, I, there we go, there we go. Okay, so, this, I, I haven't even been able to watch all of this yet, you guys, um, but I will. Um, 
<clears throat> Hang on here. All right, so we are moving on to an Idaho for topic, and um, nobody can just get enough of Idaho for, I swear. Um, but uh, anyways, are you ready to move on? Mm -hmm. So we are moving on to Idaho for, and I want to highlight a creator here because I started watching their video earlier today. They have been in our chat quite a bit. Uh, I've seen them in here hanging out and making comments and stuff like that. And that's awesome. We want to support people every chance we can, right? Um, and um, yep. we have here the law offices of andrew d myers and the video that i started this is interesting talked about um the uh the orders of uh discovery the uh hang on let me pull it up here so i can know exactly where i'm talking about it Okay, so there's the 15th. So what I'm talking about is the defendant's supplemental request for discovery, okay? And the law offices of Andrew D. Myers started this conversation. I haven't had the chance to finish the video yet. Like I've told you guys a million times before, I just don't have very much time to watch content, period, at all. Um, so shout out to them. If you haven't checked them out, Please check them out. They are awesome. They've hung out in here a few times and have been very active in comments and things like that. Um, and uh, um, and uh, we appreciate them. We appreciate them as, as content creators. We appreciate them as people. And uh, they always have really good questions that they bring up. So... Check them out. I will put a link in uh, the. There we go. Yes. And Andrew Myers, he is a lawyer. Uh, Lainey is not. I believe I, I watched a video from them a while back where she said she's like. An assistant, something like that. More mansplaining. But what do you mean? She's not like she has no legal experience. She's um, she's like some. She helps him with technology. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And she's like and a tech, cool. a techie Look, type. Person. I'm not the type of person. So there, there's a few different professions out there that you really need what would be considered an expert in that profession right a doctor's one of them and i consider a lawyer one of them too and and there's other non-white collar ones like plumbers i've talked about the importance of blue collar uh work a, a ton of times on here um and like plumbing you can't randomly walk in to a house and be like oh yeah i can connect some pipes i'm a plumber you know what i mean there's so much to it same with electrical and all those jobs as well um but uh when it comes to opinions right where i'm going with that is when it comes to opinions on case documents and true crime and investigations i don't think you necessarily need absolutely need an expert to have an opinion i think the accountability of the people is the most important aspect of any uh community anyways right because anybody that is putting their dollars into an organization or institution gets a say in it it's just that simple right you're putting money into it then guess what you get a say period that's it uh it happens like that in the stock market it happens like that with our civil institutions so um but uh so what he started talking about in one of his most recent videos is that there have been a whole bunch of updates to the docket, okay? And we've looked at this quite a few times together, but this is the Idaho 4 docket, you guys. And shout out to them for uh, for finding this. But um, 
I didn't realize because one of the videos that we did recently talks about the 14th supplemental request for discovery. So in the beginning of his video, he talks about since they've made some edits and updates and things like that, they actually took out the 14th supplemental request for discovery. It is not in here any uh, or hang on. the not It's the right there. The hang 13th. On, hang on. 13, 14, 15. Yeah, it was the details around it with the gag order. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, the details around it with the gag order. And when they were take, making those updates to the 14th, uh, the 14th supplemental request for discovery, there were details in that that they that they had taken out of it. And he goes into, and this part isn't even the focus on uh on what we're covering but i started wondering what is discovery in general and like why because okay so the big question here is not is is why somebody has to ask 15 times for discovery okay and we've asked this question a million times and are they asking for the same thing? Is this standard in common? Are they changing their asks every single time? So like, let's say that there's 10 pieces of discovery, okay? Let's say we got my 10 chapsticks here and uh, your, your supplemental request for discovery asks for those 10 chapsticks, right? And then you get them, but you realize two of them don't have the wrapping on it. So then you have to submit a secondary supplemental request for discovery, where technically that is a part of the chapstick, but for whatever reason, it wasn't in there. Is that why we're seeing so many supplemental requests for discovery? And why I'm asking this question is because when it comes to the supplemental request for discovery, the way it's portrayed in the true crime community is that everyone sees them asking 15 times as being the state hiding something. And you guys know me. For those of you that have watched us for a very long time, you guys know that I am not here to try and protect Brian Koberger. I'm not here to try and protect the state or the prosecution. We're trying to understand, dig into, and get down to every single detail and sliver in this investigation, right? So why do you think there's so many supplemental requests for discovery? And do you think that's normal? I don't think that this many supplemental requests for discovery is normal. No, um, I think what's happening is exactly what Ann said in court in that she's getting discovery. She's looking through it. She's opening folders um, and there's like, OK, for instance, she has a police report. And it says in this police report, there is attached body cam. She opens the folder to see the attached yeah, body so cam it's and it's not there. So then she has to request that. Yeah. Um, like the autopsies, she opens the folder where the x-ray should be. They're not there. So she has to request that. Everything's very disorganized. She's having to sort through all of it, open fo open, opening folders where exhibits should be and they're not there. Um, so I think that this is unique a bit to this case. Uh, I'm sure there's been other cases where this has happened, but this seems very excessive and it seems like there's a major issue here with how disorganized the discovery is. Um, and yeah, it just seems like a chaotic mess. And I makes me wonder if it's intentional because I've never heard of it being this chaotic before ever. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And and that is and some of the details I found are very It feels like a tactic, if I'm being honest. It does feel like a tactic. And that's why I'm trying to find out is it a tactic or is it standard, right? Is yeah. this what we can be expected to see in any old case that isn't a high profile, isn't a capital case? Okay. <clears throat> so I just had to have time to think here. So on the docket it's the state's response to the 14th. I'm sorry. So when I was talking about the request for discovery, when they made the edits recently, which I think they just made more edits on like the second or third or something like that. So they just made like a whole bunch of edits to the docket and removed them. And it's the state's response to 
uh, the 14th request for discovery, which was up there and has now been taken completely down. Why? So uh, we don't know. We don't know. That's what another reason why people have said that um, when do when documents are put up here, you should save them if you care about this case or any case, because there are a lot of times where after the fact, the state or the defense will be like, well, that kind of talks about one of the angles we're taking in court. So uh, we need to have that removed. Right. And they have a, a very broad and open gag order and um, sealed uh, order within this case. And they can cover and do anything, essentially, uh, with any information in here. So I did I had heard that things were taken down in the past, um, but I had never noticed it myself. Yeah, we I know we have a copy uh, on three videos ago I, is when we we read it. Um, so it's helpful reading it on online. I'm sure I have a copy somewhere, somewhere on these 12 computers in here. Um but uh, and we can dig into it if I'm remembering correct. Uh, the 14th supplemental, the the state's response to the 14th supplemental is the uh, thumb that we did that I accidentally have a typo on that says like January 14th or something like that. And we go into the details about it. And and there was something interesting in there. I'm gonna have to go back and pull it up. But anyways, going back to my original question here. So is the defense. Okay, so this is what I've come to, the conclusion. Ready? Yeah. So, is the defense creating reasons to ask for supplemental discovery requests to make it appear like the prosecution can't be trusted? Or or okay. 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 Is the defense only getting partial discovery requests causing them to continue these discovery requests over and over and over and over or three are they not getting all of the discovery like most people think and it's being held from them and they're finding it on their own through their own investigators and they have to continue submitting these discovery requests to get it because they don't have a full breakdown of the discovery gathered by the state what do you think what was the second choice the second choice was um are they not getting the full discovery request the chapstick example so if you ask for one through 10 and they give you one through 10 but there's pieces missing out of it where you have to submit another discovery request so you're essentially asking for the same thing with extended pieces okay so you're saying the defense is getting what they asked for but there's missing pieces of correct it. yeah i think it's a combination of that and the last one okay i think that is the same so thing. why do you think that uh, I think the state is giving them over things like expert reports, but then the exhibits are not attached. So then they have to follow up with another supplemental request. Okay. I think that's been happening this entire time. Okay. What? Nothing. I'm thinking this is a think tank topic. I'm I'm coming to conclusions in my own head because look, I, I think that, the uh, presentation of Brian Koberger, the presentation of the defense and the overall, you know, painting of his character is top of mind. And if you're already approaching a situation, let, let's pretend we're Ann Taylor here. Mm -hmm. And for one reason or another, we believe Brian Koberger is not guilty. OK, like truly believe it, not not defending him, but, but believe. truly believe it. Right. Yes. But you're seeing evidence that is being handed to you that contradicts that. Right. So causing you there to be a lack of trust already in the information you're getting. 
And then you're seeing the character assassination on top of it. One of the most important things you would be trying to control is the character that is being portrayed to the rest of the public while simultaneously planning for a defense to devalue any of the fraudulent information that could be coming from the state. So submitting multiple requests for discovery and then watching the opinions of the true crime community is a beneficial tactic for a defense. I'm looking at it as a salesperson. I mean, you are what people believe you are. That's just what it is. That's not even up for debate. People are what the people around them believe they are, right? So if you're the defense and you're, and I'm not saying she's doing this, you guys, I'm just putting this out there in the air, okay? Uh, if you're the defense, and you want there to be doubt in the state and police because you believe they're corrupt already, because you believe Brian Koberger is innocent, then it would be beneficial or in your favor to submit documents to the docket that cause doubt and question into the state and investigators. Yeah, but then why would she fight for this gag order so hard? To, to control the narrative? I don't, I don't know. I don't know because I don't know what I don't know. But could there be evidence that she's worried about is fraudulent? Maybe. And that's what needed to be c controlled from coming out, right? Because let's say, let's say there's fraudulent evidence or evidence that looks really bad against Brian, but Ann Taylor believes Brian Koberger is innocent, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, for whatever reason, they know that evidence isn't real. The only way to stop it looking bad on Brian Koberger would be to gag that, right? Gag and seal everything so that nobody can know what that fake evidence is until you're able to be a defense attorney and contradict it from the start. Put something out there that's already going to show why what they're about to present can't be or isn't true. I guess I could understand the tactic um, if you're you know, concerned about the false narrative and everything. I, I guess I could understand it. I mean, I guess that's causing reasonable doubt. I mean, yeah, it's like it's creating a, a kind of an, an air, like an, like a, I don't know, what's the word for it? Like, um, what? It's just giving those vibes. It's like it gives yeah, everybody like, those vibes. Like painting that, a character. Yeah. 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 It's like it's like character assassination, but in a much more covert way. Yeah. And I've listen, I, I've said this from the beginning also that I think some of the best attorneys in the world are the best attorneys in the world because they're great at grandstanding. Mm -hmm. They're yes. great at being salespeople. They're great at portraying a certain image. They're great at the presentation. They're great at talking publicly. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that is what makes them great. Uh, ultimately, they the, all attorneys have the same access to the same knowledge. So I don't think it's a knowledge game. I think it's a presentation game, you know? Yep. So I have an interesting comment here. It, it's small, but uh, it's from Bundy Law. In virtually every type of lawsuit, at least one side is required to make disclosures of their evidence to the other side. However, most attorneys do not make the required disclosures because they are afraid of the other side getting the full evidence and scope of the picture. Fortunately, each side can obtain information from the other side and from third parties. This is called the discovery process. The purpose of discovery is so that each side has knowledge of all relevant facts before trial. Knowing all the facts encourages settlements and reduces the risk of surprise at trial. I found that really interesting. 
I mean, that's super wrong when you're in a capital case, um, a criminal, a criminal trial. Like, this is not a civil lawsuit. Like, this is criminal court. This is a capital DP case. The I, that's state not talking only about civil. has to turn over everything. Um, so I understand that. I get that. That lawyers so, don't want to give everything over. So there's a they difference between. They feel like they're between, giving away. There's a difference between things they're gonna use. the written law and the knowing I understand law. that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We've talked about this in length before that. Uh, what's it called? I'm drawing a blank. Um, the power of not knowing, like, um, if 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 there's evidence out there, and Bill Thompson tells an investigator, "Hey, don't give me that evidence." It's plausible deniability. Yeah, plausible deniability. So um, he would have plausible deniability in this case. I have wondered that from the beginning. You know, which I mean, it makes you wonder about the cast report. It makes you wonder about the cast report. Yes, it absolutely makes you wonder about the cast report because every everything we've looked into into the cast report, there has not ever been a situation where a cast report has taken years. Mm -hmm. So then what what is the problem? Why did this one take years? Do we know? Can we know? Wouldn't discovery be also reasoning around why something is taking longer than it needed to? We have a whole bunch of people in here. What's going on, everybody? And uh, I just want to give a shout out to the three platforms that do not have uh, comments on there. We see you. We're yes. glad you're here with us. Uh, and you are actually coming on stronger than all the other platforms but if you guys wanted to chat we are on youtube at thought riot podcast spell all the way out on youtube so you can come over here and chat we've got a few people in the chat uh or you can hang out there but hit that like button hit those stars hit the that uh that rating and uh come hang out but so because discovery sounds like such a simple concept, right? And a lot of times I found that when I'm doing my investigations into uh, any topic, it really doesn't matter what it is, any topic, right? Um, some of the most simple processes and topics are uh, can pack the heaviest punch because they could be the topics that are the most uh, exploitable. Mm -hmm. right sure so we have this idea that by law they have to give over every piece of evidence right yes but do they have to give over every piece of evidence what if that piece of evidence doesn't have anything to do with brian what do you mean that some of the evidence they're not giving over has nothing to do with him, so... Yeah, that it doesn't have anything to do with him. Example. The fight at uh, Sigma Chi. Brian wasn't there, but it shows that there could have been some animosity between fraternity brothers with Ethan Chapin and other fraternity members is this evidence going to be submitted it doesn't have anything to do with brian yeah but they're supposed to submit inculpatory and exculpatory and you know evidence not from what i was reading it's yes they have to if anything's exculpatory i mean there are things that are determined uh, relevant and irrelevant so exactly it could be exactly. determined irrelevant exactly. but they are supposed to include exculpatory evidence yeah like there are laws surrounding this and it okay. may not be directly exculpatory yeah, but right but okay so you're using exculpatory different than i am right now so uh Proving there was a fight at, at Sigma Chi is not exculpatory it, to Brian. It could be exculpatory maybe. in a way. In not, a way, I mean, maybe that it's a gray area. It is. It's a gray area because it doesn't prove anything having to do with anything with the crime. 
So I don't call that exculpatory evidence. Um, I, I think that it could be uh, a lead, you know, if they didn't have a suspect. But uh, I don't think details like that are going to be included. Because legally, they don't have to be. It's very possible. So the whole first month of the investigation, you guys, seems like the police were focused on this 4chan theory. They were asking for video evidence. They were asking for audio uh, recording evidence. They were asking for all this different evidence in the area of the Sigma Chi house. Mm -hmm. But then what seems like Brian came on the scene, Brian Koberger, and they went a completely different direction. Yes. So in the Karen Reed case, there's a whole bunch of evidence that a lot of people believe proves her true or, or, or proves what she's saying as true. But the judge ruled if it doesn't have to do with Karen Reed, then it can't be in this case. Weird. So then I'm, I'm continuing to dig through the discovery details and process what the expectations are legally. It doesn't seem right. It doesn't feel right. I agree with you. In my opinion, I feel like if you're a defendant, you should get everything. That has to do with the case, period. Period. Everything. I agree. I think... I think that there is an area of opportunity for us to fine tune how we uh, store, track, and manage investigation details in cases so that it can all be shared reliably. But it got me wondering, right? So I, I started on... Um, the the law offices of Andrew D. Myers video. Then I started digging into like different discovery types. Then I started digging into what is legally required as discovery for the defense to receive. Why is the defense having to submit 15 different requests for discovery? What are they expecting to receive in those uh, requests for discovery? Does the prosecution have to include Sigma Chi details, the fight details, uh, any of the 4chan details, any of the video in Moscow, Idaho that doesn't have to do with Brian Koberger's route of drive? I mean, when you look at the Delphi case, for example, okay, the defense's whole Literally, their whole direction, okay, their whole strategy in their defense mm -hmm. is pointing the blame at other people, at Odinus. And that has none of their information about those people has anything to do with Richard Allen. If they didn't have the Odin report and all the things that were given to them in the discovery, they would have no idea about any of that. You're right. It was vital to that case. Yeah, it is vital to that. I case. was going to say that that wasn't shared. The defense had to ask for it. You're like proving my point here. The prosecution didn't give that over to the defense. As they found out the because of Todd Click discovery. Correct. Todd Click came forward and 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 which said something proving, about it, which is proving my point here. Yeah, because the standard should be anything tied to in the investigation into any crime. Yeah, it's a, I, I, I know it should be. That's how I feel like it should be. It should be anything that the police uncovered while investigating that crime, period. It but should include all of it. The attorney should be able to that. dig through all of it. Yeah. Well, it doesn't mean necessarily we'll see it at trial. As long as Anne received it and they could dig through it, then that's important in my opinion, even if they don't present it at trial. I just don't know if we're going to know if she received it or not or anything. Exactly. I don't think we're going to know. And uh, that unknown is massive. I think it's a huge, 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 huge deal. 
I think it's going to continue to drive interest and question marks around this case. And I wish this was a topic that we could leave this podcast with today. Me being able to be like, look, guys, I do feel like there's a way out here. Unfortunately, this topic is not one of those. I am still diving and reading and digging into this. And I feel less certain than I did going into it originally. To be honest, I really think the way discovery should be handled is anything that the cops give to the prosecutor has to be given to the defense. They should have the exact same things. See, I, I so I think it needs to start before that. I think everything that is gathered in an investigation, everything, every conversation and every body cam, every recording, every call. Everything, everything gathered in an investigation needs to be shared with defense and the state. Yeah, I And agree. I don't think that the state should be able to control that. No. I think that there needs to be a third party system that manages everything having to do with a case. Right. So if cops are going out there, they can determine whether, Hey, I'm going out as an agent for this case here. Cool. You know, now we know that we need to get your body cam. Once you get done on shift, we need to get any evidence that you, you gather for the day and we are going to connect it and upload it into this electronic file that stays here. One file, all evidence, very clearly put together, very easily put together, this, that, and the other. When somebody gets arrested and they go to trial, guess where that goes? To the judge to then be given to both the state and the defense. Mm -hmm. That's what I think should happen because I see problems here. The more I dive in, oops, sorry, guys. The more I dive into this, the more problems I'm feeling and 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 seeing around these discovery issues i don't even when it comes to the amount of discovery requests it's one of those things where i've been complaining about it for so long now that i wish there was something to it that was shady but i don't think there is i don't it, it seems pretty standard actually yeah uh it seems pretty standard for a case that has this much electronic discovery they have i think they said like a total of twenty thousand photos overall in the whole case they yeah. have like tens of thousands of audio video picture evidence so that amount of uh of of discovery request is pretty standard yeah and I kind of wish it wasn't because if we get up to 20, 30, I want to be able to complain about them. But they're, it's pretty standard from the research I was doing. Oh, so the supplemental requests are standard? Yeah. Yep. Yep. That many? Yeah. For a case that has this much evidence. Yeah. Yep. Is the disorganization of the evidence standard? So I don't think that is standard. No. Because no. it's chaos. Like it is it, chaos. There You're is right. no organization at all. They are yep. giving it to her in the most dig disorganized way possible. I, I agree with you. I agree with you. And that, that's another problem with the discovery I wonder also is that, again, I don't think that it should even be in a position to be allowed to be given to the defense scattered like that. I, somebody needs to take that that out of their hands i wonder if it could, should be like the county or uh the court clerk who the all the evidence goes to a system of theirs like the police have to send everything like the, or the county clerk gets it from their system and pulls it all and has it all organized and then is like sends the file or gives them the hard drive or whatever. Here's one for the state. Here's one for the defense. They're identical. That's it. Tomorrow I am writing a new app and it is going to be for evidence for police officers. Hey, super easy. You get your evidence, you take a picture of it, you upload it, you date it and you give a brief description and move on. Then you can submit it wherever. All you really need is a very trustworthy list. Right? So in an app, technically what could have happened is you could have shared a list of every single conversation, 
every single video, then if that if that if that discovery and or evidence isn't there and the list that can't be edited is then you know you got problems because i don't think there's going to be anything in this case that they're going to be able to lean on to prove that they have problems i just don't see it huh. i don't see it i don't think any law enforcement place would use an app like that <laughs> No, no, they they don't want things to change for whatever reason. It, police hate change. They're like, very resistant to they, it. Yes. Yeah, they are the most resistant to change, period, point blank, ever at all from anyone. It is. It's absurd. It's it, it's so ridiculous how resistant they are to change. Um, But. Uh, yeah, it it's interesting. It is. I never thought you were going to say the amount of supplemental requests was standard. Yeah. Th I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with it. So it, it's one of those situations that it's left up to the reader. Okay. So is 13, 14, 15 a lot for us? I, maybe it might be a lot for you. It might be a lot for me. It might not be for you. There's no way to know. Hmm. But in a case with this much discovery and what seems like this much evidence that isn't in the state's hands, if that is the case, it's not that uncommon from what I'm reading. All right. That's interesting, huh? It is. But is are these requests for the same in the same evidence now I mean, that would be interesting if they knew a video was out there 100% knew a video was out there and they are not getting it we've seen doubles on a few of them mm -hmm. we've seen certain uh, numbers that keep popping up like they don't have this they don't have this they don't have this oh and they have to keep requesting it over and over because they're not getting it it is the same stuff mm. we've seen that i i mean i've read it in several of them um the most recent ones and some of the first ones from the beginning they were requesting the same things over and over yeah now the gag order is so airtight we know very little. We know very little of what exactly they're requesting, but. Yeah. I'm curious if they ever got the training records of the police officers that they were requesting. That was so quickly passed over. It was very quickly passed over. <laughs> it's like they never wanted to talk about that again. The Brady Giglio. And I did see someone say it earlier. And absolutely, that's a massive deal, you guys, because look. Who gathers the discovery? Law enforcement. Police. I mean, yeah, it's... Yeah. And she wasn't... She was only requesting it for a few officers. I don't see why there's an issue with her getting that at all. I mean, I do. I understand it. Police stick up for police. That's a well-known problem. She's not asking police for that information. I mean, she is. She was asking for the training records from a, uh, a judge from the. Yeah, but they got to get it from police. That training records come from your employment. I get it. But the judge can just say, yeah, OK, I and get it for. Her. I hear you, but you're acting like things are done quickly when a judge says that they are and without any twisting of arms. I mean, clearly it isn't. We're seeing it in this case. So I don't think that is the case i would be curious if they ever got those training records i'm curious too and i can't wait to know exactly who it is i already think i know who but me too i can't wait to know exactly who it is it'd be interesting to find out it's all three people that attended the autopsy i'm telling you there's something shady with that autopsy police that's not standard that is not standard it is not scientific 
it's not supporting in any way, it's a problem. It's a problem. There should not be law enforcement officers there watching over a medical examiner. I mean, I are you kidding me? I've heard of officers attending autopsies. Yeah, well, then they're probably dirty too. I don't. That's pretty extreme to go that far. What? Okay, then give me a good reason why they're there. You know, medical examiners use the cops' information to determine the cause of death, right? Yes, and that's all done on report. All of it. Yeah, on their report, yeah. Yeah. So they gather the information that they would need from law enforcement from a report. They don't ever ask them there. Why would a cop be at a medical, a doctor's place of business? I mean, for one, it helps them get information really, really quickly Dude, to no investigate way. the case. That comes for on a two, report. For two, um, I think if they're working on the case, being there in person could help them understand a little bit better. What? Um, understand what? They don't. So a, a medical examiner, the coroner, they, they aren't there to tell a story. They are there to offer their findings of the evidence that they're seeing from the corpse, the body. And they go through a whole bunch of different details of weighing different things, checking different things, you know, under nail, all that good stuff, all of it. And there is no evidentiary benef benefit to law enforcement being there with them, with a medical doctor. Look. I, I get what you're and saying. It, and it creates and, flawed science. And I, while I agree with that, I lost a, I, you know, I lost a lot of faith in all of that because I found out how subjective autopsies can be. They're what? super subjective. I mean, the autopsy report can be very subjective. It, it's not. I mean, so it, it is. So what you're saying, it's not subjective. What you're talking about, it are there autopsies out there where the medical examiner has lied? That has I'm not talking to about do lies. With subjectivity. I'm not talking about lies. You're you're okay. Then like explain how it can be subjective. They are influenced by all the information collected by the police. What information's influenced? What they know, they are told everything about how the body was found, where it was found, uh, things yeah, found around not, it. That's not included. That's not included. What What's do you included mean? is like they look for any damage, details, and evidence on the body. They usually are also the ones that do the uh, the blood test, drug, alcohol, whatever, all that good stuff. They uh, scan and look for any uh, physical damage to... Yeah, why you know, are you explaining all, all this? Because that's not subjective. It's either there or it's not. Yeah, that but is their final, science that's their black final and decision is subjective. They will give you all the facts. They will give you all of the ob objective scientific information Yes, sometimes I guess we've seen lies in autopsy reports, but they'll give you all of that. And then they come to a determination of cause of death. Yeah, but medical examiners and how the person determination died. doesn't ever give a concrete of what it is. So uh, that's why we have uh, police. Um, uh, that's why we have uh, police, the the law enforcement scientists where a medical examiner will say, uh, I believe that this victim was killed by a blunt force object to the back of the head. Okay. So gotcha. That, that is the cause of death. Now they take the pictures. They will give the scientific evidence, the breakdown of how deep it is, how wide it is pictures, proving that thing, things of that nature. And then the, the scientists that, you know, aren't, medical examiners aren't doctors will try and mimic and repeat that evidence to prove what was used to uh actually end a person but i think i think a medical examiner is one of the more objectively factual positions that is in true crime oh i don't agree 
Well, we got to agree to disagree on that one because uh, lying doesn't make it subjective. That's just a liar. I'm not talking about lies. Well, I just don't understand still what you're saying is subjective. I, I'm just having a hard time understanding that because it's none of what they write down on their report is left for subjectivity. It's all measurements and weights, and uh, they give a potential likelihood of what ended them. So, like that, that's not subjective. I mean, all I just said, they give all of those details that are objective, and then they have a final opinion of what killed this person. So, it is their so, expert opinion. So, you're just talking about them being subjective on what they say caused the death. Yes. Okay. Okay. It is subjective. It is opinion. Yeah, yeah. I got you now. I got you now. Okay. The, well, that makes more sense because I consider that, I would consider that like 2% of 100% of a report. Um, whereas, you know, the medical examiner doesn't determine what happened in the crime. They They give their best to determine the cause of death, you know? I mean, they... I mean, that's not completely true. They do determine what happened in the crime, too. Like, for instance, with um, the the baby, uh, Alexi Trevillo, the baby, um, they said it was entrapment that the baby was in an enclosed space until it consumed all of the oxygen and then suffocated and passed away. Yeah. Yeah, I I don't I just don't have an argument there because I don't know enough of the science to say like why that's subjective or if they're just able to prove that 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 child had oxygen in their lungs and then didn't. So that is the why they said that. I just don't know enough. Yeah, it did. The baby did have oxygen in its lungs and then didn't. Yeah, I got you. I just need to look into it before I have an opinion on that. So I don't I don't know if that is subjective or not, you know. I'm not sure. I mean, I think it can be, even though I agree with it. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. The, what makes it subjective is if there is another possibility, it could be something else. If there is another possibility, sure, then it's subjective. If there's not another possibility, then another it's possibility, objective. another possibility is that the baby was killed in another way and then put in a plastic bag. The only reason they said it was entrapment suffocation is because there was no broken bones and the baby was in a bag, found in a bag. Well, wouldn't it prove entrapment? entrapment if it had lung in its oxygen or oh. oxygen oxygen in its lungs no because that means that it had oxygen and then didn't because the baby could have been smothered very easily without causing damage to the face there was no damage to the face or the throat and it was in a bag so they determined it died in the bag Okay. Because it was found in a bag. Okay. okay. And there was no damage to the face. I okay. think it's subjective, but even though I agree with it. Yeah. Because I, I still think there's still a possibility it happened another way. Yeah. Is all I'm saying. But these details, I don't know, matter that much. I yeah. don't, we're, we don't need to be stuck on this anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. I, I think there is super important details, personally. I mean, I think it's really important because, again, I go back to the law enforcement, I think, makes this situation uh, not believable, not the medical examiner. Just because somebody disagrees with the medical examiner doesn't necessarily mean there's like a lot of space for uh, subjectivity. You know, so science is not subjective. If it's repeatable, it is not subjective. If, if someone is making science subjective, then they're doing science wrong. There is no opinion. Yeah, but you can't. How, how could you make anything in an autopsy repeatable? It, you're using the same tools of measurement. 
it doesn't matter what you're using those tools on, the same tools of measurement are being used. I mean, every case is very, like, different. Yeah, but that doesn't matter as long as you're using the same tools of measurement and you're using the same basis of calculation, which I assume they are. I don't know. Just but yeah. move on past it. We will agree to disagree. All right, you guys. I think uh, that is it for Thought Riot Podcast, episode 38. Make sure you guys hit that like button, leave a comment under the video, and uh, yeah, we appreciate you, and we're going to be back here tomorrow uh back in it with the two other stories that we didn't get to talk about tonight and uh yeah mm -hmm. anything else to add we'll see you tomorrow i go hope you guys have a great night um and yeah it was it was a good show it was it was and you were all awesome amazing have a great night, everybody. We appreciate all of you. Thought Riot Podcast, out. Bye.